Uh, the event that you are joining in on today is called Best Call of the Day, How to Build an Authentic Career. So uh, super excited about this event. Huge uh, shout out to our partner on this, the Knock Method. Rebecca, do you want to say a little bit about the Knock Method? And then I can go into my short GA spiel. Absolutely. Thanks, Anna. Uh, hi, everyone. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Rebecca Leader, and my upcoming book is called Knock, How to Open Doors and Build Career Relationships That Matter. It's based on my five-step method to building high-quality career relationships, and I will share a little bit more after Hannah's intro. Awesome. Um, just a few meeting norms before we kick things off. This is a Zoom meeting. So um, please make sure that you use the Q&A. Actually, we won't have a Q&A. So just use the chat for um, general questions, but we will be going into um, some breakout rooms at the end. So you can always save your questions for these awesome panelists as well. Um, please make sure that you are muted and go off video here because we would like the focus to be on our panelists. Um, we will do a panel presentation and then go into breakouts. Um, this event is being recorded and transcribed, so we will make sure that we send that in the follow-up email as well. Um, and then any resources that are mentioned today, we'll make sure that we share in the follow-up email as well. So just a little bit about General Assembly. We are a global education company, so we help people find the work that they love through education. So how we do that is through our immersive programming, our part-time programming, um, and our short form programming. Uh, but some of my favorite things that we do are these fun events with uh, industry experts where they get to talk a little bit about their career path and how they got where they are today. Um, and then with that, I'm gonna shoot this over to Rebecca. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much to General Assembly for being our partner. I've had the privilege of teaching classes in digital marketing at General Assembly and they're a fantastic resource for workshops, career development and um, finding a community to grow your career. So we're really grateful to them for being here as our partner. Um, as I mentioned, I have an upcoming book. I'm so excited to share it with you. It's launching on March 30th, just about seven weeks away. And as I mentioned, it's based on five steps to building high quality career relationships that are mutually beneficial. And what that means is it is about providing contribution, about helping people, about partnering, about making relationships, not just about yourself, but about what you can do together. And um, it's also about authenticity and how you can bring yourself, the good, the bad, the strengths, the weaknesses, the wins and the fumbles to your career relationships, which is the topic of our event this evening. The panel that is here tonight, we are in for a treat because they are not easy to get on the schedule, especially on one night. They're very busy bringing their best and authentic selves to work, and they're making huge impacts in their lives and their work in their communities. So I'm very, very excited, and we want to thank all of our panelists for lending their time, their inspir inspiring stories, and their hard-earned advice with all of you. Um, I hope you'll join me on my VIP email list to be one of the first readers to get my book when it launches. And uh, tonight is also the night of my book cover reveal. So thank you for joining. So excited for uh, all that is to come and really appreciate all of you being a part of the Knock Method community. I would like to thank uh, Kezia Douglas. She is our social media and events manager, and she is going to share more about how this evening is gonna work. And then we're gonna get straight into the panel. Hi everyone, my name is Kezia and I am the social media manager with Rebecca, helping her with all things marketing social media with her book, Knock. Um, I'm very excited for the event tonight. And before we get started, I just wanted to talk through some logistics. So if you have not already joined the Knock Method LinkedIn page, make sure to go onto LinkedIn and search us um, and request to join. I'll be um, accepting requests throughout the event. And within this group, we are gonna have all the information of all of the panelists. And once we go into breakout rooms, um, the LinkedIn group will be a great way to connect with those in your breakout room groups. So we really recommend um, joining our group. And also follow us on Instagram at the Knock Method if you haven't already and on Facebook. 
we'd love to share more with you. Um, so as I said, we will be um, breaking out into sessions at the end of this. And um, yeah, we're really excited. And the last thing I wanted to say is throughout the event, if you want to post on Instagram, whatever social media, I will be checking and we'll be having a randomized winner at the end. Whoever posts the most on social media will get a free copy of the book, Knock. So make sure to post and tag us. Thank you, Kezia. Uh, so clearly authenticity in your career is a big topic. It might feel fluffy and a little bit vague, but we asked those that registered for this event what they're struggling with or what's on their mind when it comes to authenticity in their career. And as you can see, there's a lot on everyone's mind. You see things like we're working remotely and I don't feel like I can be myself behind a computer screen um, and I don't have opportunities to connect in person or I'm getting stuck on meetings without a purpose or maybe without an agenda. I'm not quite sure why I'm there, why I'm spending my time doing this. Um, maybe you're not aligned in your career with what you really wanna do and with your values. So uh, we are really excited that this panel is here to share some of their lessons learned, some of their experiences. It might get a little bit deep, it might get a little bit emotional, um, but we're really excited to have a, an open and honest conversation about what it means to be ourselves when we are approaching our career. So that being said, let's take a look at the panelists. And um, I wanted to briefly say thank you to my family uh, for being here and for supporting me in this effort um, to host an event series as well as to launch the book. Um, and I also wanted to thank these panelists for being who they are, for being here and for really helping all of us to create community. I also wanted to mention that authenticity is something that I also struggle with. For example, it's taken me over six years to go from concept to writing my book. And I used to be very insecure about that fact. And now I use it as a way to talk about how that time afforded me the ability to experience new career opportunities that I wrote about in my book to meet new people, many of which you see here on the screen. So it might be about taking those things that we find to be you know, our insecurities and actually flipping them and using them as a value add and as an asset when we're approaching career relationships. So that being said, um, I would love to kick off the panel and our speakers are going to um, speak here tonight. So I'm going to ask a few questions and they're gonna chime in. Uh, Kezia is gonna be helping us with questions that come in either the chat or on the LinkedIn page. And we'll try to get in as many of your questions as possible before the breakout sessions. So let's go ahead and begin. Uh, we're gonna do a round of um, introduce yourself and tell us what you do. So um, if you wanna jump in and uh, just tack on after each other. I'll go first, okay. Or Jenna, you wanna go first? No, Ryan, please, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm Ryan. I get anxious when there's moments of quiet. So I try to, my codependency jumps in to save the day. So here I am. Um, so my name is Ryan Weiss. Um, I go way back with Rebecca and I'm honored to be here. We went to summer camp, Jewish summer camp together. How old were we? Like it was like <laughs> around 10, 11, something. Like somewhere around <laughs> Very fond memories. Um, and actually, I think in terms of my career and my work, was really inspired by that Jewish summer, summer camp and the community and the safety that I felt and this real sense of connection to spirituality. And I uh, had a former career in the entertainment industry. I'd been a performer in Wicked on Broadway and then was an agent at a massive agency and then was producing film and something wasn't really feeling connected for me. And I went on quite a path to kind of start learning about things like the trauma that I had experienced and um, and deepening my sense of spirituality. And it ended up creating a career for myself as a coach. So I support people, um, mainly people who are dealing with overwhelming amounts of anxiety in their career, in their relationships. Um, and I help them to deepen their, uh, their emotional intelligence, um, to deepen and develop their spiritual practices so that they learn how to slow down and nurture themselves, connect with their intuition and take actions in alignment with where they really wanna go. Um, and I also developed a program called the Sanctuary Challenge, which is a free mental health program, which is a 60 day commitment to five daily self care practices, um, learning about accountability, how to commit to oneself, how to put oneself and one self care first. 
Um, and I think that's it for me for now. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you. All right, I'll go now. <laughs> I'm Jana ben Scherscher. I'm in Bryn Mawr, PA, so just about 10 miles outside of Philly, originally from Chicago, uh, which is where I met Rebecca. Um, so I'm the founder and CEO of Twist Out Cancer, which provides psychosocial support, which is just a fancy word for emotional support to individuals touched by cancer through creative arts programming. I started the organization couple months after my own diagnosis with gray zone lymphoma, which was about 10 years ago when I was 29. And I found that, you know, as I was going through cancer treatment and with a rare type of cancer, as a young adult, there were plenty of organizations out there that were focused on research, but there was not a lot of information and certainly not a lot of support when it came to sort of the emotional impact of a cancer diagnosis, not only on the patient, but also on their families. And for me, what I found was incredibly um, helpful was that essentially I started just sharing and really oversharing what I was experiencing uh, through blogging, through dancing and sort of reconnecting with the artistic side of myself that had been quieted for so long because I was working in a you know career in a nonprofit at the Anti-Defamation League and hadn't really made space for other interests outside of my own work. And I think because I was facing my own mortality, I didn't really feel like I had that much to lose. And so in the process, I was very open and raw and honest and took a lot of risks. And when I finished treatment, decided to create an organization that really focused on the needs that I experienced and wanted to be able to, to sort of provide resources to folks that were in a similar situation. So we've been at it now for nine years and it's just been a really beautiful experience. Thank you for sharing, Jenna. I can go next. Um, uh, my name's uh, Eric Silverstein, and um, I'm based out of uh, Austin, Texas, which is coincidentally where I met Rebecca. Um, and uh, a little bit of background on myself. Um, I'm actually formerly a, a, a lawyer. Um, so I was a litigator for three years um, in St. Louis, Missouri. I went to law school at Washington University in St. Louis, stuck around and was a litigator for three years um, and then completely changed my uh, career and started a, a, a food truck down in Austin uh, about 10 years ago called um, the Peach Tortilla and uh, have since grown that business um, into uh, five different um, hard locations, um, one of which is in Boise, one of which is inside the, the airport uh, in Austin um, two full service restaurants, and then all, we run a big catering company and an event space. So, um, my, my passions have been, um, uh, in entrepreneurship and in, in food. Um, it clearly wasn't in the law. So, uh, I'm no longer in that part of uh, my career, but uh, I've spent about 10 years uh, in hospitality and, um, we continue to, uh, grow as a company, although uh, the past uh, year has probably been uh, the most difficult time uh, to be in hospitality um, with the pandemic. Um, so definitely uh, a lot of challenges coming uh, with the current situation. So that's a little bit of background on what uh, we do here in Austin. Thanks, Eric. I noticed it took you a minute to say I was a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, was a lawyer, right. Still licensed <laughs> or retired. <laughs> retired. <laughs> well, I'll go next, but I'm also a retired lawyer. <laughs> um, I'm Erica Pierce, and I am a, um, a millennial leadership coach. And, um, you know, my career started off, I live in DC, I came here to work on Capitol Hill and save the world and change policies and do all that stuff <laughs> and realize very quickly that um, the world I thought of politics was very different from the reality of politics. And so I um, transitioned to really focus on um, kind of, you know, going up the corporate ladder, um, spent 15 years in corporate America, held a number of executive level positions, had a lot of fancy job titles, um, did well financially, but really felt that my work lacked purpose. Um, 
and had lots of Sundays, like so I called it the Sunday blues of where, you know, you dread Mondays <laughs> and just, you know, having to get out of bed and go and do work that you just do not feel um, excited about. And so last year um, on uh, June 19th, I quit my job, um, did not just did not wake up that morning to quit my job, but <laughs> around four o'clock decided to do so. And, um, and really follow work that I had been doing kind of on the side, which was helping people, coaching young professionals. Um, and it was something that I wanted to really focus on, but, and I, and, and um, thought I could do both, but for me personally realized I just could not have the scale of job I had and do the work that I wanted to really do. So um, it's not easy, you know, but <laughs> certainly trying to be purposeful and, you know, uh, run a business, but certainly don't have the Sunday blues anymore and really do feel excited and just um, really glad that I made the decision for my, uh, the right decision for myself. I don't advise everyone to wake up and quit their job <laughs> without a little bit, you know, <laughs> of planning beforehand. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. And Erica just launched an amazing community. She'll tell you more about it later, but um, I had a chance to preview it and it has so many amazing resources for millennials looking to uh, drive and develop their careers. So congrats, Erica. Thank you, Rebecca. I guess I'm last. So my name is Brant Menzwar. I am a, I guess a, f a former rock star, uh, 20 years in the music business uh, with my band, Big Kettle Drum and uh, transferred from one platform to another about six years ago into the conference keynote speaker world. And that is how I make my living. Uh, I'm also an author of the book, Black Sheep, Unleash the Extraordinary, Awe-Inspiring, Undiscovered You, which Rebecca's <laughs> doing her best Vanna White right now, and I love it. Um, it is all about helping you discover what I call your flock of five black sheep values. And so I'm sure we'll get to that sometime today, but I just thank you so much for having me here, Rebecca. And uh, it's, a, it's a real honor to share this panel with these amazing people. Thank you so much. Um, as you can see, there are some interesting themes here to these individuals. Some we didn't even recognize until we had our preparation call, but um, many of them are artistic in some form or fashion, whether it's hospitality, Erica made the art in her background, a musician, um, and uh, Jenna's organization is also artistic. And I would say Ryan's mindfulness practice is also some form of art. So um, really in interesting, um, you know, commonality there. Commonality is also in the book knock. Uh, so I would love to explore a little bit about what is authentic in your, what does being authentic in your career mean to you? So we can go through the same order if that keeps it simple. Okay. Um, so to me, authenticity is about making choices that are really connected to my authentic, my true needs, my true desires. And that means even when they don't match up with what I perceive that other people need from me. So it's about learning to stop abandoning my own needs out of fear that I won't be accepted, out of fear that it won't go well, and learning to stand up for what are my needs? What are my passions? What are my desires? And I'm gonna learn to find my voice and speak them and stand for them even when I'm afraid even when I'm afraid it won't go the way you need it to go. Um, and, I'll, and I'll stop there. I can resonate big time on that one. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> Ryan, that's like hard to follow. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, you know, because I was sick for so long, I spent a lot of time just, um, having a lot of alone time and time to really dig deep. And I think what became very clear to me is that it was super important for me to work, whether it's a nine to five or a nine to nine or whatever your hours are, that it's really important to feel like you have meaning in what you're doing. And it doesn't mean that it, that meaning has to be forever. It just means that you're making some type of impact um, where I can go to bed at night and I can wake up in the morning feeling like I'm making 
some type of difference. And it doesn't mean that I'm transforming lives. It just means that I'm moving the needle forward a little bit. And, you know, I think because I was able to spend a lot of time really having to listen to that inner voice, I think of frozen every time I say inner voice, but it's true. Like, you know, it's really like focusing in on what is, what is the most meaningful work that you could be doing and taking that risk. And I think because I wasn't sure if I was going to make it to 30, I felt like I could take bigger risks. And now being 10 years out, I have to remind myself that that I can still do that. Like I don't need to settle into um, just doing, you know, what's easy. Um, So I, you know, I feel like thankfully because I blogged about my experiences and have so much sort of like content that I put out that at times makes me cringe when I go back and look at it. Um, A lot of times it's, there are a lot of good reminders out there for me now, like 10 years later to be able to look at that and say, what is really important? What did I learn from that experience? And so, um, yeah, I think the, the meaning piece of it is sort of like the common thing theme for me. Thank you, Jenna. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm curious if you're willing to share an example of something that has come back up as, you know, I can still strive for that next level or I can still, you know, put myself out there a little bit. Is there a recent example that you can think of? Um, in terms of like taking a risk? Mm-hmm. You can come back to it too. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I I struggle now because I was so outspoken 10 years ago about my cancer experience and now I'm a parent. And so um, I struggle a little bit in terms of how public I want to be about what I'm currently dealing with, partly because I want to protect my daughter and my family. And just because I'm comfortable with it doesn't mean that they're going to be comfortable with it. Um, So finding that balance for me and recognizing that who I was 10 years ago isn't who I am now. And certainly who I was pre-cancer is not who I am now. And so just being like kind to myself and allowing myself to evolve and know that, you know, just because I was outspoken about a bunch of things doesn't mean that I need to be super outspoken now and trying to figure out where my voice is on certain issues. I think that's sort of a constant struggle for me. Whereas before, you know, if there was something going on with me, I would be like, got to go to social media and blast it out. And now I'm a lot more you know, thoughtful about what I'm putting out there. Um, yeah. I don't know if that totally answered your question, but yeah. that was what I was just thinking about. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for lending your voice tonight in a public forum on these topics too. Cool. I'll jump in. Um, as far as what authenticity means to me, I mean, for me, uh, you know, when I was, when I was practicing as a lawyer, um, it it honestly felt very inauthentic, um, because I was, uh, not passionate about what I was doing. Um, I felt like, uh, kind of like a robot, you know, just clocking in, uh, billing hours because, uh, that was what you were told to do. Um, so it was important for me personally to pursue a career that I was really passionate about, um, where I could, express myself in a lot of different ways, both artistically with food and design and in in terms of building out our restaurants, um, our branding, uh, the type of food we serve, the type of service we deliver, um, but also uh, pursuing a a passion and and just, you know, running businesses and growing businesses. So for me, uh, you know, your your true self kind of shines through when you're doing something that you really care about and that you love. and uh, I think it only helps that uh, at, at my restaurants, we serve food that really I grew up eating as, as a, a kid or was inspired by my travels. And, you know, I lived overseas for 11 years in Tokyo. And so trying to uh, bring those flavors to the table. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of different notes in terms of what being authentic means, but um for me, I'm, I'm not sure there's anything really more authentic in trying to serve food that, um, you know, hits close to home in, in a, in a restaurant that you designed and created and, uh, with, with staff that, um, you know, cares about what, what you're trying to achieve as a company. Thanks, Eric. I remember when we talked about your logo 
over 10 years ago now. Um, could you share oh, yeah. a little bit more about the name Peach Tortilla and how that might tie in your life? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I grew up in, uh, like I said, I was born in Tokyo, and then I, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia when I was 12, and uh, grew up in Atlanta, went to high school there, and then moved to Missouri for college, but, um, you know, Peach Tortilla is a, 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 paying homage to, to Georgia and the Peach State, um, but really, it's more representative of, you know, just, I don't really operate the business or run the business with any sort of rules and, and you know our name is not dictated by any any sort of rules a lot of people are like that doesn't really make any sense mm -hmm. um, but that's okay you know uh, I'm not we're not trying to please everyone um, and uh, you know the name is built into kind of you know my background we, we say tortilla because we started off as a food truck and we were largely doing um, tacos burritos and bowls so the, the whole menu kind of shifted when we went brick and mortar um, but yeah, that's, that's the name. And we kept the name, even though we, we went into all these different iterations with the business. We also have another restaurant called Bar Peach, which, which is a little bit different as well. Thank you. I still want you to bring the Szechuan veggie taco back. <laughs> <laughs> Selfishly though, I still remember what it tasted like. That was my first. Maybe my first when we reopen in the, in the airport. I'll be so, there. I'll okay. fly there for you. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I would say just in terms of, you know, um, echoing what Eric just said, you know, I, I think being authentic in your career, you know, it's hard. I'll be very honest. It was something that was really hard for me um, working, especially in um, a corporate America space where, you know, for many, for many people, it feels as though, you know, they want you to do the job, they pay you money and you're not really supposed to show any, you know, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> things that are outside of the lines, the brand guidelines almost. And then when you are also in a visible position. So, you know, for example, in my last role, um, I was one of six people that was uh, one of the senior executives in the company. And I kind of got my hand slapped a couple of times for doing things that um, were off brand. And some of these things were um, helping or we're hosting webinars for young professionals to learn how to give presentations on Zoom. Um, so nothing that was crazy, <laughs> but they felt as though it was a distraction from what I was supposed to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, it's when some of those things started to happen that for me, I just felt like I could not, I wasn't being I wasn't able to be authentic and do, you know, my nine to five and do the work that I, I felt purposeful. And some people can find that balance. And again, I think it depends on what type of role you are and what your, your end goal is. But um, I think that, you know, just acknowledging the fact that it, it is not always easy to be authentic to who you are and still, you know, um, do the job that you were, were hired to be. And I think, especially in, in the corporate space, um, there are times where you can even be put into positions where you feel very uncomfortable. Um, you know, last year, I had a couple of situations where, you know, they would come to me, especially when some of the things that were happening around um, some of the, you know, social justice issues. And they're like, Erica, you go and tell them that we're committed to diversity and, and such. And I'm like, well, I don't know that I agree with that, right? <laughs> but, you know, but I'm supposed to go and say that because I am one of the senior executives. And so those are, those are types of conversations and types of things that you have with yourself. And sometimes you have to make hard decisions and you have to um, be truer to yourself than you are to your, your paycheck. And that's, that's difficult, but um, I do think it's something that, you know, I, I believe it's great that we're having more conversations about this because it's the side of, of growing up and of, of career advancement that's not always um, talked about. And then one other thing I want to say is I did not do these paintings. I want to be authentic. Oh, <laughs> well. oh I missed the joke earlier. <laughs> that was <a> joke. <laughs> I don't want to take away from the, the artists that did these. So I want to be honest. my mistake. I but not, you are. I have a lot of talent, but this is not one. Of them, so. I I totally missed the joke earlier. But you are channeling your authenticity in your office yes. space. So thank you for adding color to the call. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Well, Rebecca, I think you could imagine I have a pretty. Uh, <laughs> 
particular thought on on authenticity. Um, you know, Erica just said that it's really hard to be authentic at work, and I don't disagree. And and when when we think, I think when most of us are are thinking through authenticity at work, we think about behavior, but authenticity really isn't rooted in behavior. It's rooted in values. And so when it's difficult to be authentic, it's because we don't know what our values are. And so, you know, the concept behind black sheep was I was 47 years old before somebody finally sat me down and said, Hey, stupid, here's the real reason why farmers don't value black sheep like the rest of the flock. And it's because a black sheep's wool can't be dyed. So every black sheep is hundred percent authentically original. And so when I heard that, I'm like, that is literally my life's goal. I just want to be that, you know, unique creation that I was meant to be. And so when it comes to authenticity, we have to figure out what our non-negotiable values are and we have to live by them. And it's making decisions through them and activating them so that people can see them that allows you to be authentic at work or in your career, or however you want to do it with your, with your partner, with your family, with your community, it doesn't matter. You have to figure out what those non-negotiable values are. Otherwise, and this is might be difficult for some to hear, you're winging it. And when you wing it, you rely on things like accidents and luck for your success. And I can't afford to rely on accidents or luck. So you've got to discover what these are. If you want any prayer of being authentic, you it is just impossible to be authentic without knowing what those non-negotiable values are. Thank you, Brant. Do you have an example of how you might activate a value in your life? Like how that might actually change something that you would do? Yeah. Well, uh, every single day, you know, so for me, um, you know, my flock. So I told you, we all have a flock of, of, I believe we have five, maybe even six of these non-negotiable values. So, you know, my flock looks like this. And so when you look and see here, creativity, hope, impact, empathy, family, authenticity, every decision I make in my life gets filtered through these six things. And I either honor them or I violate them. So saying yes or saying no is really easy for me because I simply look at these and decide what I need to do. So how would that work if I'm at work and I'm having, um, to engage and activate my values in my career. Let's say my, uh, you know, we have an assignment uh, coming somewhere from, from the top down. Uh, and one of the organizational values is transparency. Well, how are you going to engage with transparency? Well, the answer is in these non-negotiable values, right? So I have to look at mine and say, how can I creatively engage with transparency? How can I use transparency to drive hope to my team? How can I use transparency to show empathy for my coworkers? You see, I'm actually acting with deliberate intention. I'm not winging it. I am using the things that make me that 100% authentic original to have unique contribution. And if you want to reach that next level, you wanna be success, you have to figure out what makes you unique because that's what makes you valuable at work. So that's that would be my how I would actually address those things for sure. Thank you, I need one of those flashing screens <laughs> to just pull up <laughs> at a moment's notice. Um, and I will share just a quick thing here because I am a huge fan of Brant's thoughts and the book that he wrote. Um, and we'll share a bit more about that at the end. I took his assessment to figure out what my five, my flock of five uh, black sheep values are. I'm still testing them out, but I believe them to be impact, creativity, authenticity, caring, and connection. And I will say, I'm proud to say at least this event, um, I know it brings authenticity to the forefront. It's about caring. Many of you have stories that are challenging and difficult. And I care about all of you as individuals, as well as those who have joined us this evening. Um, we're creating so much connection with the broader group, as well as the panelists. Um, it's very creative because we're bringing together lots of artists and thought leaders here. And um, hopefully everyone's feeling like this is making an impact and inspiring you in your own life, in your career. So I'm excited to say I can at least apply them through this event and hopefully in my daily activities as well in order to prioritize you know, how I evaluate opportunities. Like you said, you can't say yes to everything, but if you have that list, it can help us make decisions and choices. So thank you, Brandt. All right, we have about uh, five to seven more minutes to um, get some amazing advice from the, this 
fabulous panel. I hope all of you are enjoying it as much as I am. I could go on for hours, but they have many other things to get to. So I'll just ask a few more questions. Um, if you don't mind. So one of them I would like to ask, um, how do you regroup, recenter, or recharge? So you're, you know, you're all um, amazing leaders and individuals who are creating great things and making an impact, which means people are coming to you for advice. They're coming to you as a community builder. They're looking for resources and you don't have unlimited energy and resources. So how do you recharge and how do you recenter and you know, come back to that place of authenticity for yourself. I know Ryan, you'll love this one. <laughs> same, same order, you wanna go in the same order? Um, go for it. Yeah, so I'm really focused on, first, so firstly, recognizing that everything in life is always pulling us off our center. That stress is something that we're experiencing all day long, whether we are momming or dadding or looking for work or working. Um, our system is always accumulating stress. And so I think it's really important that we look at ways throughout the day that we intentionally build in pauses throughout the day to check in with ourselves, to ask, how am I doing? Do I have a need? How can I meet that need? It's much like a parent would do for a young child. A parent is always tuning into a young child saying, what's going on with my child? What do they need? Um, most of us didn't learn how to do that. I can get into trauma and the lack of nurturing that all of us experienced, mainly because we grew up in family systems where our parents were stressed, uh, they maybe had issues going on with their health or with their relationship and weren't able to complete or had unhealed trauma of their own um, and maybe weren't able to fully tune to our needs. And I, there, comes to a, there comes a point in every adult's life where we have to learn how to start caring for ourselves. And as I said before, because the nature of life is stress, the nature of the ego is go, 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 so I can prove myself, so that I can make the money, so that I can build the life, so that one day in the future, I'll finally be happy. And because that's the nature of the way that we exist as a species, we actually have to do things to disrupt that really fast speed, to get in touch with a slower pace, which is actually where our authenticity live, which is where our creativity lives, which is where our abil ability to connect with each other lives. And also um, a place where that kind of um, tank of fuel needs to be restored. And so I really look at this as two main places in my life. One is how do I start my day? And two is how do I end my day? So for me, I begin every day with a 20 minute meditation. Now, a lot of people are gonna hear that and go, holy crap, I can't meditate. My mind is too busy. I can't sit still. I don't have the time. Yeah, I'm seeing Brant raising his hand. Um, I have a lot to say about that. I wanna be respectful of time. I, I, shameless plug here. I have a meditation that you can go, go through in the Sanctuary Challenge. It's totally free and it will guide you. It's like literally made for the person who can't meditate to just gently guide you into learning how to just let it all be here and let it be okay. And let it be okay that your mind is going a million miles a minute. You're doing so much for yourself. When you start the day and be highly intentional to not jump on your phone, not jump into work mode and literally say, I am my priority today. Um, the second practice I call goddess time, whether you, no matter what your gender is, um, we have feminine and we have masculine. The masculine is the part of us that is doing, thinking, caring for others, focusing on what's going on out there. Um, and, the, and that part of us, no matter our gender, is typically really strong. The world in which we live our, and our education systems has really strengthened that ma more masculine nature. The part that gets uh, atrophied is the feminine, the part of ourselves that actually knows the art of doing nothing knows how to rest without scrolling, without watching, without reading, without writing, knows how to just be in the practice of doing nothing. And so at the end of my workday, like as soon as we jump off of this live, I have no more clients, no more calls. I'm gonna go lay down, put my feet up a wall and play a little meditation, or I'm gonna go get in the bathtub as a way to just relax away the stress that I accumulated throughout the day. Most of us take the day's stress and never build in a pause. And then we take that stress into the evening. We wonder why we're disconnected or angsty with our partners. We take that into bed with us. We wonder why it's so hard for us to fall asleep. And then we bring it into tomorrow. And then we have decades of accumulated stress living in our system. And we wonder why just one little thing sets us off. 
because it's not about the little thing, it's about the lifetime of unprocessed stress that we're all walking around with. And so we need to build in practices throughout the day to give an opportunity for that stress to relax so that we can be in relationship with our most authentic self. Easier said than done, but not impossible. It just requires accountability, community around accountability um, and consistency. Thank you, Ryan. And I will say one tiny, tiny, tiny thing I've been doing because of Ryan's sanctuary challenge is putting my phone on airplane mode when I go to sleep and even and putting it away in the closet so that I'm not thinking about it. And I know that even if I have the urge to check it, I can't because it's off. So thank you for that little tip. And I agree. Um, I'm trying to create that space um, even just a few times during the day. So appreciate you bringing us back to that practice. You got it. Jenna, what do you have for us? Um, well, so I think a lot of that definitely applies. I wish, you know, Ryan, I might have to follow up with you after I'd love to be able to figure out like, you know, a way to have five self care activities a day. I'm definitely not doing that. I think I'm maybe doing one or two. Um, but I am making them rituals. So like I have a bath at the end of the night, no one bothers me. It is my favorite time of day. Like I, I don't do anything but sit in quiet and it's kind of the best or read a book. Um, I will say that, you know, I'm th like 30, almost 34 weeks pregnant. So I feel like I'm just constantly giving, I'm giving to a a child that isn't here yet. I'm giving to my five and a half year old, to my husband, to people that are involved with the community. And it takes a lot of emotional energy out of me. And so I have been trying to find ways to really carve out time for myself. And I think for so long, I was always scared to break appointments or to cancel things because I'm such a people pleaser. And you know, I'm always worried that someone might react in the wrong way. But a good example is, you know, I, I went, I spent three hours at the hospital today getting poked and prodded and looked at, and I was supposed to have meetings in the afternoon. And I just said, I cannot do this. Like I'm taking a nap, I'm taking a bath and I will recharge and be able to like face the rest of the day. And this stuff can wait. And I think because when I was sick, I was, everything had a TBD next to it. And I was so used to scheduling things and then canceling. It's almost like a trigger for me to have to do that again. But I realize now that I'm doing it in a way because it's something that I'm listening to and it's in my control and I feel a lot better about that. So, um, yeah, I'm not feeling bad about needing to carve out time for myself. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh I probably am not as uh, diligent as Ryan is on uh, the the daily meditation piece. Um, I, I wish I wish we had time in our industry, uh, but given how COVID has impacted uh, all our restaurants and operations, uh, I also have two young kids. So I have a I have a uh, not even a two year old and then a four year old um, who have not returned to school yet, and so uh, the pressure with uh, trying to restart restaurants and and uh take care of kids and 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 be a husband has been challenging so i i can't say that i've been really good about finding moments to decompress and uh you know take care of myself i would say that right now uh if anything if i'm more diligent in terms of accomplishing my tasks for the day and i keep as rigid a schedule as i possibly can to accomplish what i need then there are moments of time where, you know, I can take time to decompress, whether that's a 30 minute lunch where I can listen to a podcast and it has nothing to do with my business or, um, you know, I come home and uh, put on a, you know, a basketball game or something on, on a night that, that I'm not uh, working. It's really tough to do in hospitality because your business is run 24 seven. You know, you're, you're running, you're essentially open when everyone's off and you're open on weekends. So uh, I'm still struggling with trying to figure out how to mentally decompress when uh, all our restaurants are, are open. Um, so I, I don't have a, I don't have a great answer, but right now I'm focused on small wins throughout the day, whether that's 10 or 15 minutes or, or um, you know, 30 minutes at night before I go to bed, just doing something that has nothing to do with uh, my business. Can I jump into that 30 seconds? Because... Eric, a lot of the people that I work with are definitely in your shoes, in Jenna's shoes, young kids, 
um, high stakes profession moving really fast. And one of the things that I see really helpful, this is not me trying to coach you, Eric, you seem like you have an incredible head on your shoulders, but one of the things that I see that really helps people is to figure out a way to set kind of a timer on the phone. I'll have them set like every 30 minutes, just something that goes off that just reminds them even for 30 seconds to take three deep breaths and just reset the system. Um, yeah. And I've seen that as people do that over time, they may not be able to get the 20 minutes in, but maybe by the end of the day, they've had 30 second snippets that collect 10 minutes of just like caring for self and prioritizing self. And I find that to be really helpful for people. Thanks, Ryan. Let's finish this off with Erica and Brandt, and then we're actually going to wrap the session. It's gone very quickly, I think, at least for me, hopefully for the panelists too. Um, so I am someone who is, I'm an overachiever. I'll be 100% honest and um, have spent most of my life in a very fast pace, you know, lots of responsibility, traveling, going a lot of places. So the past, I would say, year has been, um, you know, it's, it's had, it's, it's been eye opening to kind of have to sit and think um, and not be moving as much. And that it, sometimes it drives me crazy. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it. But I will say um, the single most transformative thing that I did that has helped me um, both personally and professionally, probably about two years ago, was starting a daily meditation practice. I aspire to do 20 minutes, but what I find is that if it could be three minutes, it could be, you know, uh, 15 minutes, whatever it is, I, I celebrate the small win that I just, that I did it as opposed to me, because I am I go in instantly into the tracking, okay, I did seven minutes, and then I did it three days in a row, then I did a hundred days in a row, I can't break it, so it's just letting go of that, and just accepting like, okay, did what I had to do today to get through it, um, and then the other thing, and it's funny that you say that, is that I do brain dumps all the time, you can maybe see it, this is one I did this morning, where there's so much swirling in my head, and I just got to get it out, and so I will just write for like five minutes, just whatever it is that's kind of going crazy, that's jumping around my mind, just get it out of my head, and then once I dump it out, I can usually um, regroup, you know, and, and really start to figure out, you know, how I can um, get going forward. But, you know, I, it's, it's not, you know, these are things I love hearing what other people do. Um, but I will say taking that time to breathe. I just got a, um, Apple watch last week. I did never want it one because I find them to be very disruptive, but the only thing I like about it so far is it does have that breathe app on it that tells you, <laughs> that tells you to breathe. So that's something that has been helpful to me as well. Thanks, Erica. I agree with the breathing. It's good to have that reminder. <laughs> Simple things. So I suck at this <laughs> at a level that is embarrassing. <laughs> um, so I'm not even going to pretend for a second that I have a word of advice uh, when it comes to recharging or anything like that, because uh, I, I, I don't. And that's just hashtag authenticity. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I did, but I, I will tell you this. One of the things that at least for me, even though I don't know how to do it well, um, what was important to me is to try to figure out where it was coming from. Um, what was overwhelming me. And, and, uh, so I'll just tell you, I live by a Lao Tzu quote that I think is like this barometer that really helps me know where I am. And so this quote was, uh, uh, if you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. And if you're at peace, you're living in the present. And I literally use that to sort of figure out what I'm doing. If I'm depressed, chances are I'm dwelling on something in the past. If I'm really anxious about something, I'm worrying about something that hasn't happened yet. And if I'm at peace, it's because I'm in the moment. So I, I try to be in the moment as much as I possibly can in the now. Um, but uh, with regards to recognizing, yep, yeah, this is where I am. This is what it is. I still suck at trying to fix it. So that's, that's that. The end. Mute. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever want to just hop on a call just to like take three deep breaths, just call me and I would be glad to jump on it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I know that we are running out of time for the panelists this evening, but did want to open it up and see if anyone had any questions. We can take one or two before we get into the, the, the book cover launch and then the breakout sessions. 
if you wanted to post your question in the chat um, or raise your hand there, we can unmute you. All right, well then I'll give the panelists an opportunity if there's anything else they wanted to share on the topic of authenticity um, or a tip or something that they're working on, maybe a project so that others can engage with you afterwards. Anyone can jump in, you don't all have to answer. <laughs> Um, so as you said earlier, um, Rebecca, I just recently launched a, um, a membership community that's really focused on millennial professionals. So I do a lot of coaching um, for millennials and they oftentimes are getting messages from them, emails, and they would say, you know, is there a website? Is there some place I can go to where I can find, you know, just career advice and resources? And, you know, I don't, there's, I, there's lots of like places when I Google a million things come up and I go to YouTube but, and Reddit, and, but there's not just a one-stop place. And so I did a lot of research trying to find um, that type of resource and I couldn't find one. So I decided to create one. So um, I've recently launched, it's called the Millennial Boardroom Community. And it's based upon what I call the level up framework, which gives you career coaching. It gives you accountability, it gives you networking and it gives you community. And so it's, um, it's, it's a great community to come together to you know, advance your career, but also connect with other like-minded ambitious millennial professionals. You don't have to be a millennial to join it, um, but that's kind of the niche audience that's there. So um, certainly invite anyone who wants to learn more to um, feel free to reach out to me. I'm um, on Instagram at the Millennial Boardroom, or you can check out the, um, the website, which is themillennialboardroom.com. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. And I love the, your level up song that you play on your Instagram stories. <laughs> <laughs> that's you great theme. Being authentic is that I love, I like to pump up before anything that's happening. I'm as excited that you played music before this webinar. And I always tell people I'm not for everybody. You know, my personality <laughs> is not for everybody and I am okay with that. So if you don't like music before a webinar, you don't want to come to the community. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. No, your energy is fantastic. Yeah, Anyone I'll, else? I'll share. I mentioned briefly, Erica, I'm firstly going to come join because that sounds incredibly supportive and uh, I'm excited to see and come check it out. Um, not dissimilarly, but I, I, I created this free program at the beginning of COVID. I was noticing, so I've always been on, on Instagram doing live streams and trying to just put out a ton of free content around developing emotional intelligence, learning how to feel our feelings, learning how to allow them to be here, um, learning how to interrogate them, ask them questions, figure out what our needs are, and then learning how to nurture ourselves. And, um, at when COVID hit, I saw this incredibly, we all, we all saw it this major jump in anxiety. And one of the things that I've always looked at anxiety, I always thought anxiety um, isn't necessarily a feeling, that anxiety is actually whatever the feeling is that we never let ourselves feel, that's what's bubbling up. Um, and I wanted to find a way to get the deep work of self-care into the hands of, of as many people as possible and totally for free. Um, and so we created a program called the Sanctuary Challenge and um, when you sign up for free, there's access to all the tools, accountability trackers, um, you have access to communities because one of the things that we are really focused on is that so often in life, we think that we have to hold ourselves accountable, um, but what do we have each other for? What if we all could create these accountability communities to support each other in becoming the best versions of ourselves? Um, and so I would love for you to come check out the Sanctuary Challenge. We're also on Instagram. I go live on Instagram almost every morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time, um, taking questions, focusing on different themes. Um, and I would so love to see you there. That's it. Thanks, Ryan. Anyone else? Okay. I'll, ju I'll just oh. say real quick. Uh, you know, go to your Barnes and Noble, walk in there, buy Black Sheep, uh, the book, or perhaps wait for the audio book, which comes out in the next 60 days. So excited about the audio book. Um, we, we actually scored it like a movie. So it is going to be this incredible experience for you to listen to it. Um, but uh, buy it wherever you want. Just don't go to Amazon. Don't give Amazon all the, look, they got enough money. Go to your local bookstore, find it somewhere. You know, I don't go, go to the local library and borrow it, but just, you know, 
if you're going to get it, let's let's share the wealth so that Amazon doesn't get all of our money. Yes, thank you, Brant. Can't wait for the audiobook. Anyone else? Okay. Um, we are going to take one audience question and then we're just going to shorten the breakouts briefly um, just to make sure everyone gets their questions answered in the bigger group. So Kezia, go for it. Yeah, so in the chat, Peter asked a question. He said, what did you learn from your last career that you brought to your current career? Um, so if any of the panelists want to answer that question. Sure. The very first thing that comes to mind is kindness matters. Um, when I worked in the agency world in Hollywood, it's all about relationship building. And I noticed there was a lot of snarkiness and a lot of backstabbing. And for whatever reason, I was always choosing to be kind. And um, even though I went into a field that couldn't seem more polar opposite than the, the business of entertainment, all those relationships that I built 15 years ago in entertainment have shown up for me tenfold, a hundredfold in my career today. Um, and every time people start re-engage the conversation of, I'll never forget that moment, Ryan, when you gave me a helping hand. And so I think kindness really matters, um, caring for people. It, it comes back. Yes, even from summer camp, here we are. <laughs> Anyone else wanna hop in quickly? I'll go, sorry. Um, I would say one of the things that I learned in my um, last career that just kind of takes me to what even what I'm doing now is always, um, you know, big picture thinking. So, you know, I think, um, I think it's just always important to make sure that you have certain goals, um, that you have a compelling vision that you're working towards. And when I worked in the corporate space, I was, um, I was the executive over growth and strategy. So I was always thinking about what was the company's five-year plan? How do we set them up for, you know, to, to grow, acquire companies, all that kind of stuff. And I, I think I've taken, you know, all of those pieces that we had, that we were very disciplined, you know, con always having meetings, checking in, how, how are we tracking towards benchmarks and progress? I now use that both in my career and also personally. Um, I have a strategy meeting with myself. I have strategy meetings with my clients, um, but I, I just think it's important to make sure that you know, you, you're thinking about what that vision is. It doesn't have to be five years. It may not have to be you know, like this huge compelling vision, but you have to have something that every day you're motivated you know, to get up and to keep following your dreams and to, and to continue to go down that path. And I think companies, especially in the corporate space, they do that very well because obviously they're thinking about revenue. But for us, I just think that, you know, you personally have to be thinking about what is your own sort of, you know, revenue, what motivates you, what brings you happiness and make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're tracking that you're doing those check-ins um, on a, on a, on a repeated basis. Um, and you're just not sort of, you know, kind of uh, just wandering around, not really knowing where you're going. And I think it goes to what Brant said as well. It's just that once that's when values and things like that really become important. So that's been something that was very transferable from my corporate space to my, not just my current career as a coach, um, but also to my personal life as well. Thank you, Erica. And I think that's a positive note to end on here because there was a vision for this evening. I would say it exceeded all expectations and um, it's really just amazing the energy um, in the virtual room to be able to hear such amazing stories of um, resilience and challenge and um, just the everyday struggles that we have in today's world, but also all the successes we can have regardless. So uh, thank you, thank you to each of our panelists for being open, for speaking to us um, even a few minutes over the intended time frame. Um, all of us who are on the call are very fortunate to get a peek into your work and your life. So with that, speaking of vision, um, I did not have a vision for what my book cover would look like when I set out to write it six years ago, but I'm very, very excited to um, have you all here for the launch video of the book. Um, it's becoming real and then it will be here in seven weeks or less. So Kezi is gonna play the video. Who is it? It's my book cover reveal. Well, come on in.
Yay! Yay! Thank you so much for being here. And thanks to my husband for being the vocals and the creative director for the video. Um, and thanks to Brant for the inspiration to have a little bit of pizzazz this evening. Uh, so the, you are the first ones to see the book cover, literally aside from my family. Uh, so excited for this amazing, bright, insp inspiring, green, green light go, um, you know, confidence builder book to be in your hands, on your shelves, share them with colleagues, share them with friends, students, graduates anyone you can think of. Um, the cover is exciting, but the stories inside from people like Eric and Jenna and others, and then also the tips that are inside the book are really what I'm so excited to share with you. And um, I really can't thank all of you enough for being a part of this community and supporting a very, very large endeavor. So uh, thank you for being here. I never imagined launching my book cover in a virtual setting, but here we are. Um, and so we will be sharing this live on social media. Please share it with your family and friends. And I can't wait to um, share it and get your feedback as well. So um, on that note, we will send out some resources after the event, um, including a specific Black Sheep Values Assessment. It's very easy. I took it myself online specifically for this group. So we'll share that in an email. Uh, so that you can find your black sheet values. Thank you to Brant and would love for you to join the VIP email list. So as soon as the book is ready, you'll be the first to know. Uh, thank you to Hannah and General Assembly. Thank you to Kezia for running the show. And thank you to our panelists for lending extra time this evening. Um, and for those of you who spent your evening on yet another Zoom, I hope it was the best call of the day. And we are going to now break into groups here um, I think Hannah has a slide with the themes for each group. And um, if you end up in a group that you weren't intending to get into, you can reselect a room based on the topic. Otherwise, you can choose your room um, and get to know your, your group, connect with them on LinkedIn, ask any questions you have of your group leader, the panelists. And um, we'll just do about 15, 20 minutes to let everyone get on with their evening. Um, and I just can't thank you enough for being here tonight. We are excited to connect with you going forward. Awesome. I just opened all the rooms, so feel free to pop into whatever which one you want to go into. You should be able to select whichever room you'd like to pop into. And if you have any troubles, you can just chat me and then I can help, or you can come off video. So if you go down to your bottom um, right corner, you should be able to see which breakout rooms you can join. So am I just supposed to click on it or? Yeah, well, which one would you like to join? I can assign you to one. You wanna to go to Ryan's? Okay. Cool.
So it looks like we have mostly everyone back. So thank you all for being here tonight and appreciate you all taking the time. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, everyone have a great rest of your evening and we hope to see you all online again soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.